Hello again, everybody. Um, so today I'm going to do a, a talk, mostly, on hibernation. Um, so hibernation is coming up, and as I put my ants into hibernation, I will show you the steps that I go through so you'll be able to see. Um, but what I don't want to do is I don't want to show you and then for you that's like almost too late because you're trying to follow my steps and you perhaps haven't got the equipment or you haven't been able to prepare for this yourself. So what I thought I'd do today is give you a talk about the process that we're going to go through over the next month so that you understand again where we're heading and what our final aim is going to be. So Obviously I can't show you today because it's what's going to happen over the next month, so that's why I can just talk about it. Um, but what you're looking at here, the pictures I'm showing while I'm doing the talk, is my colony at the moment. Um, and there are signs in here that they are preparing for hibernation and um, hopefully by the end of my talk you'll understand what I'm talking about and you'll be able to spot the signs that I can spot. And as I said in previous videos, keeping ants, one of the things is, is that you understand your ants, you understand where they're at, you understand what they want, um, and when, hopefully after today, after this talk, you will understand what signs you're looking for in your ants over the next month. Right, so first of all, there are two terms which are used around this period, around this, and the first of those is hibernation. So hibernation is a state of minimal activity and metabolic depression. This, this is what creatures do where they slow down and they go into like a sort of a winter sleep. But you'll also see people talking about a word called diapause. Um, and diapause is the delay in development in response to regular and recurring periods of adverse environmental conditions. So the diapause is slightly different to the hibernation because you can have, you can be, ants could be in diapause without being in hibernation, i.e. they could have slowed down their development in preparation for hibernation. And then it is the act of hibernating which will get them to come out of diapause and I'll explain all of this during this talk. So let's talk about what's going to happen. So first of all, ants um, fall into two categories, and I'm not going to go into the science of this today, but if you are interested, you can start to look up the science of hibernation. But the two categories are that some ant species rely purely on temperature, um, and therefore they can be fooled, i.e. if you keep it warm, they don't think it's winter. But other ants, and all of the species that I'm keeping, both Laceus niger and Laceus flavus, and actually other UK species like Formica fusca, they don't rely solely on temperature. They rely on all sorts of environmental clues that let them know what time of year it is. So obviously they don't know the exact date, but they've got a rough idea based on temperature, light levels, day length, possibly things like air pressure, even perhaps, I mean, Formica fusca do this really badly, is like day counting. They can almost count the number of days since they were last in hibernation. And for example, if you bring them out of hibernation early, they will want to go back into hibernation early. So you can have Formica fusca wanting to hibernate in August because you brought them out too early and they've counted the number of days. But what they will do, ants, all the ants that we're keeping, Laceus niger and Laceus flavus, they will know fairly roughly, but within a certain degree of accuracy, what time of year it is. And so they know that it's autumn. Um, and what they want to do is they want to slow down um, completely for about four months. Okay. Um, again, I'm not going to go into the science of this. I've read some scientific papers um, which were actually about um, Laceus japonicus, which are a similar species to Laceus niger, but not the same species. And it's very dangerous to take information about one species of ants and then apply it to a different species. But we can 
sort of infer that if it happens for Laceus japonicus, it probably is similar for Laceus niger. Um, that it's been shown by scientific research that they need a minimum of 90 days. Um, but to be on the safe side and to keep it natural, um, what I would advise for your Laceus niger is about four months. They should be in hibernation from November, December, January, and most of February. Um, I'll talk about that at the end. So, what is going to actually happen in hibernation? What's going to happen is your ants really need to be at a temperature of less than 10 degrees C um, for those four months, but warmer than freezing. It's very, very important that you don't let your ants freeze, because if they do freeze, that could kill them. Um, now, I spoke in my starting equipment video about um, getting yourself thermometers um, and how knowing the temperature of your ants is very important. At this time of year, it becomes very, very important. It's a critical thing that you need to know what temperature your ants are at. So, like I said, those four months, less than 10 degrees. Absolutely perfect for Laceus niger is around the 8 degrees mark, but anywhere between sort of 5 to 8 degrees is, is right. I mean, they will tolerate it colder than that. I've seen people who have hibernated Laceus niger at sort of 2, 3 degrees, and they can cope with that, but you must make sure that they don't freeze, as I said. Um, what will actually happen during the hibernation is that the adult ants will all just huddle together, normally in a big ball, um, and even though ants are cold-blooded, or um, and therefore they don't generate internal heat to, to keep their blood warm like, let's say, mammals do, still, despite that, all living creatures produce warmth just the act of living, your cells just doing the things that your cells do, give off warmth as a byproduct. So ants do still generate a little bit of heat from just being alive. Um, but anyway, they will cluster together in big balls of them, just stacked up on top of each other normally, and will go incredibly inactive. They will just sit almost motionless. You might, when you look at them, see a little tiny bit of antennae waving, but basically nothing at all. Occasionally one will, I mean, they can still be slightly active at these temperatures, although they are very slow, and occasionally one might go on a bit of a wander around or whatever, and it's nothing to worry about. The other thing that will happen is the queen will stop laying eggs, um, because Eggs will not make it through hibernation. They would die at those low temperatures. So the queen will stop laying eggs. There will be no eggs. Larvae are fine. Larvae will go through the hibernation period as larvae. They will, they will cease to grow and they will spend the whole four months as a larvae and they will go through the hibernation period with the adult ants. But they will not pupate. They will stay as larvae. And pupa don't end up at the end of hibernation and there is um, I'm going to say that I think that some of the advice that is online at the moment is slightly incorrect regarding pupa um, I have watched I've observed when I've put my ants into hibernation with a few pupa still remaining and they were quite late stage pupa they'd been pupa for maybe two or two and a half weeks already when I put them into hibernation and I observed the ants weekly after I put them into hibernation by bringing them out of the fridge just for 10 minutes each week and I saw callows. I saw callows after two weeks in hibernation. So I know that late stage pupa can still close even at the low temperature. I'm fairly sure that it took those pupa about five weeks, which is a, a much longer than is normal. Normal is sort of two and a half to three weeks. So it took them much longer than normal to actually develop into an ant and close out the pupa. But they still managed it. And I see a lot of people on these reddits and forums where they will panic 
or not panic, but they will refuse to put their ants into hibernation because they've got maybe one, two, three pupa left, especially in that first year early colonies where they're desperate for every worker they can get. And they'll keep holding off hibernation because of these one or two pupa. What I would say to you is if you're fairly sure that those pupa are quite well developed, they're late, they're late stage pupa, put them in anyway. It doesn't seem to matter. They probably will still close. Um, and like I said, they will then just sit there in for the whole four months, basically not moving until the end of February. Um, and let's just now talk about the end of hibernation briefly. What will happen is um, that the hibernation gives them a rest as well. They, they, re they need this period. There is some evidence as well that queens, if they're not given this break in egg laying and are sort of almost forced to be active all year round, that it can shorten the life expectancy of the queen. Um, but the colony, um, I'll, I'll talk about why in a, in a bit, but the colony won't, won't do well as well if it doesn't get hibernated. Um, but what you will get next March is that as soon as they realise that it's warm again, as soon as it's been warm long enough, it normally takes Lacey's Nigra about a week for it, them to sort of think, actually it's been warm for a week now, it's time, you know, spring is here. But as soon as they've been warm for, let's say, about a week, bang! Pretty much all of that larvae that's been there over winter will suddenly pupate. And because the larvae hadn't been turning into pupa before hibernation, they've been stacking up quite a lot of larvae. And what I found with all of my first year colonies last year is that they went into hibernation with as many larvae as there were adult ants. And within, like I said, in March, they all then pupated so that by the end of March, by early April, my colony had doubled in size. So the one that went in with 55 workers was on about 110 by the start of um, April. And after that, they just exploded and off they went. So um, it's very good for your colony as well to hibernate because you will kickstart that explosion in the spring. So like I said, based on what I've said, the ants uh, need to get ready for hibernation. So what they'll do is they'll go into this thing called diapause, this delay in development, in preparation for hibernation. So the queen will stop laying eggs. If at a certain point your ants feel that there are eggs that are still there, that they're not going to manage to get them to hatch out and turn into larvae and they think that this is they're not going to happen they will very often just feed those eggs to the larvae that there are in there and actually in some of these shots that you can see some of this video you actually will see what I think in my ants are feeding an egg to a larvae so at a certain point you will end up with no eggs um, and then, like I said, the larvae will stop pupating, so they will just remain as larvae um, and, and just sit there. And for that reason, as we've discussed, um, the, um, it's the larvae that require most of the protein that goes into your colony, that's where it's going. So as soon as the larvae stop wanting to grow and stop wanting to pupate, the whole colony itself will stop demanding protein either as much or at all. So you'll notice that your ants um, forage around the outworld a lot less because they're not hunting for protein. They come out into the outworld a lot less and sometimes you put, potentially will notice that you might put in a, a dead insect and they'll just ignore it. They won't, they won't bother to drag it back to the nest like they normally do because they're, they're no longer interested in protein. On the other side of the coin they, because they're going to not eat during hibernation, you don't need to feed them for those four months that they're in that metabolic slowdown. Um, they need to get ready for that period. And what they're seeking to do now in this next month that's coming up is they're seeking to absolutely gorge themselves on sugar. They are going to stuff themselves stupid. Their gasters will fully expand. I mean, on most of my ants that I've shown up to now, you can see the two stripes on the gaster where it's expanded. 
before hibernation, you might very often you will see four stripes on the gaster. They will expand even the very last little tip bit of the gaster and get themselves totally, totally stuffed up with sugar. And I've seen some wonderful um, pictures of people's colonies. I saw a wonderful picture last year of a guy who backlit the colony so it was shining through the gasters and you could just see how all of them were totally stuffed on sugar. But yeah, that's what they'll do to get themselves ready for hibernation. So you need to make sure that your colony is getting as much sugar as it'll take basically at this time of year. So what do we need to do in October? What we need to do in October is we need to warn them that hibernation is coming, right? Because of all these steps that I've talked about, because of all this preparation that your colony needs to do, stuffing itself up with sugar, stop the larvae turning to pupa, queen stop laying eggs, all of this preparation, you can't just take a, a colony straight out of a nice warm room and slam them in the fridge because they haven't prepared for that coming. So you need to start to alert them that this, this is coming. Um, and what you do is you basically start to slowly lower the temperature over October. And that's why it's very important to keep an eye on what temperature your ants are at. So um, I've looked at the dates and from today, the Sundays going forward are the 3rd, the 10th, the 17th, the 24th and the 31st of October. So I'm going to work on those Sundays. So I intend to have all of my ants in their fridge at 8 degrees by the 31st of October. That's my deadline for that. So now I'm looking at these weeks and I've got one, two, three, four, I've got five weeks before that date when I want to have them in the fridge at 8 degrees. So what I'm now going to do is I'm going to plan those weeks ahead and have temperature drops happening during those weeks. So the first thing that I will do, and I am a bit obsessive about this, I try to make sure my ants get the absolute best sort of notification that hibernation is coming. So I'm very cautious, very slow, and do things very gradually. I mean, you can probably, and I know some people do, get away with being a bit more abrupt than I do. I mean, I think realistically the minimum that you could do is sort of two weeks notice and then stick them in the fridge. But I like to give mine the whole month of October. So my first step will be to try and get them cooler at night. Um, the critical temperature here seems to be 20 degrees. You want to drop them lower than 20 degrees, somewhere between, let's say, about 16 to 19 degrees. That's the sort of temperature range you're looking at to let them know, oh, hang on a minute, winter's coming. So with, with your ants, um, if you've got them in your house, try to think about, for example, rooms that are not going to have the heating switched on. Um, and what I will do with my ants to begin with for maybe the next two weeks is I will try to leave them in a room where the heating isn't switched on, especially overnight. I would like it if the temperature overnight maybe drops down to about 17, 18 degrees in that room. In the daytime, when the sun's coming through the window and the room's heating up, and maybe the heating's on in other areas of the house, um, that room might go back up above 20, might go to 21, 22. I'm not too fussed about that because it's dropping down at night and that's sending the signals. Then, in after a couple of weeks maybe of doing that, so maybe by the 10th of October, I will then start to try and keep them in a room that is not heated at all, even during the day. Try to keep them less than 20 degrees at maybe, like I said, 17, 18, 19 degrees all the time, 24 hours a day. Um, and one thing I did um, actually last year when I had a lot of test tube colonies is I actually used a, a, a freezer bag. The, the type of bag that you put your frozen shopping in when you pick it up from the supermarket and I took some freezer blocks and what I was doing was I was alternating the freezer blocks into the freezer bag twice a day so first thing in the morning I'd take fresh blocks out the freezer and put in the bag and take the old one out and put back in the freezer and then I'd do the same thing in the evening 
and I had the ants in a cardboard box so that their test tubes didn't touch the freezer blocks because I didn't want any sort of freezing to happen and I had a thermometer in there and I found that by doing this um, when the freezer blocks first went into the bag it would drop down to about 13 14 degrees and then as those blocks thawed out over the course of like say 12 hours it would go up to about 18 19 degrees and then I'd swap them drop it back down to 13 14 and so on so that's the way that I kept them at that sort of temperature in the lower teens for a couple of weeks last year. Um, we need the great British weather to come and help us out. We, we, we need it. It's been unseasonably warm for September, so we need it to start getting cold so that you can have some cold rooms. You may be able to think about perhaps putting them in a garage or a shed or the loft or a conservatory. Like I said, just somewhere that's not getting central heating and is not warming up and you can sort of ref mirror the outdoor temperatures. Then, for the last couple of weeks of um, October, I've actually bought a new mini fridge this year, specifically for hibernating my ants, um, and it's got a really good temperature control on it. Um, I've played with it already and seen what I can do on the different settings, and the, the highest it goes is 16 degrees, and the lowest it goes is 3 degrees. So I will put them in that fridge probably, I'm thinking, on the 17th of October at 16 degrees. And then I'll start dialing it down over the next two weeks so that by the 31st of October, they're down at 8 degrees. I'll probably dial it down a, a degree every couple of days, say 16 for a couple of days, then 15 for a couple of days and so on so that they're gradually going down to that eight degrees and then I will just then leave them in there for the four months at eight degrees. Um, the only care that they need during hibernation, they don't need any food, they don't need anything like that, but they must not run out of water, okay? Um, so if they're in the test tube, the only thing you realistically need to do is I would say check them maybe for 10 minutes once a fortnight just to make sure there's still water in their tube. If they're in a nest, if you've got a more mature colony, you need to make sure there's a water source connected to that nest. So I will put mine into the fridge with, with their water tower still connected and probably with a water test tube connected. And with the Laceus flavus, I will connect them with a water test tube. Um, the other thing that I will do is I will only put their formicariums or test tubes in the fridge. I will disconnect the outworlds to go into hibernation. And one of the ways I've found to do this is that um, Laceus niger particularly, they don't like early mornings. They don't like early mornings, especially if it's a cold early morning. So if you catch them at sort of 6, 7 in the morning, on a nice cold morning when it's maybe in that room down to 16, 17 degrees, you will probably find that you've got no ants in the outworld or very, very few ants in the outworld. And I will disconnect their formicarium off the outworld. If there are a few ants in the outworld, what I plan to do is I plan to replace the formicarium with an empty test tube. So they'll still go down the hole going back to what they think is their nest, only to discover that it's not their nest, it's an empty test tube. I might actually make it a water test tube. So they'll sit in there thinking, well, they won't think they're ants, but they'll be in there like, where's our nest gone? Being a bit confused. And hopefully I'll come back a maybe a couple of hours later discover that maybe the four or five that were running around the outworld are now sitting in that water test tube and what I can then do is take that off the outworld and connect that up to their nest to be the water test tube for the winter and then they'll come out of the water test tube and find the nest and then I'll have caught all the ants out the outworld. But there's no point in putting the outworld into the fridge because they just don't need to forage. Like I said, they're not going to need food over winter. One thing here is that um, if you are going to use a fridge, um, like I said, do not let them freeze. So I talked about this in my in a previous video about understanding your ants, that the back plates of fridges can ice up. They can actually freeze. So make sure your ants don't touch the back plate. 
Um, I would also make sure your ants have got a little tiny bit of insulation just to protect them from anything else in there that's super cold that they might touch. So I always put my ants into a cardboard box or wrap cardboard around like the formicarium just to make sure that it's slightly insulated against touching anything else that's freezing cold. And again, if you are going to keep them in a in using the natural weather outside to keep them cold. Be very, very careful that they don't freeze again. If you are keeping them in a garage or a shed, keep a thermometer in there and be monitoring the temperature on very, very cold days. Um, something that I see from ant keepers online a little bit is, well, it, 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 you know, it freezes outside at the winter, so why do ants, you know, how do they manage that? And the answer to that is, they go deep underground, um, well not that deep, about 40 to 60 centimetres I believe for Laceus niger, but if in the middle of the freezing winter day when it's maybe minus 10 outside, you take a spade and you, you dig into the ground, you'll discover that the frozen level of the earth is only the top maybe five centimeters or so it doesn't penetrate down that deep and if you go down deeper than that the earth is not frozen and it's still two or three degrees centigrade at those sort of depths so that is how the ants do it in the wild right and then Finally, what I thought I'd talk about is what happens if you don't hibernate your ants, because this is another question that I see a lot, um, and every year in November and December you see a lot of people on Reddit um, who think they're being clever and they almost come on and like gloat and they'll show pictures of their Laceus niger colony in early December saying I didn't hibernate my ants and look they're still doing X or they're still doing Y and it's no problem to me and they, they, they think they're going to get away with it. As I said Laceus niger have got a very very good idea of what time of year it is. They know that winter's coming. You can't stop them. Okay, they will go into diapause, so they will do this thing where they will stop the development, the queen will stop laying eggs, the larvae will stop turning into pupa, and the ants will start clustering together in, in little balls of ants, waiting for the cold, waiting for these four months of winter that are coming. And like I said, you can't stop them. Laceus niger like to take advantage if you'll give them anything to take advantage of. Like I said, they practically never say no to food and they'll drag it back and store it somewhere or they'll stuff themselves stupid. They'll also take advantage of it being warm in the autumn and they will keep going for a little bit. You know, yes, I believe people when they say my ants are still active in November, they probably are. Laceus niger are like, well, yeah, it's not got cold yet. We'll just, we'll just keep going for a little bit longer. But you, you won't ultimately long-term stop them. They will go into diapause. Then, what you need to get them back out of diapause, to, to get the pupa, to get the larvae, sorry, to turn into pupa, to get the queen to lay again, is you need at least 90 days of cold, less than 10 degrees. And if they don't get that, they will sit there in this diapause mode, in this slowdown mode, with the queen not laying, the ants being very inactive, the larvae not developing, they will sit there waiting and waiting and waiting. And again, I see a lot of forum posts, a lot of Reddit posts, normally from around January, February, March time, where people are saying, my ants aren't doing anything. They're just sitting in their test tube. They don't come out. They don't want to do anything. The queen's not laying eggs. They're not growing. Why not? And other people always, we know the answer, so we always ask them, did you hibernate your ants? And then those people that are complaining about this phenomenon always come back then and say, well, no, I didn't. I didn't realise I had to. And we always then turn around and say, well, that's what's happening then. That's why your ants aren't growing. That's why they're just sitting there doing nothing. And from what I've seen, because I've never done this myself, but from the evidence that I've seen other people presenting, um, it's going to take some really hot weather to convince those ants that the cold is never coming. So you might end up with a colony in stagnation, not growing, until maybe June or July. 
Whereas somebody who has put their ants into hibernation, as I said, when they come out, the colony doubles in size within the first month, and then it just charges off with those new greater numbers. And by June, July, it's, it's, it's gone insane. It's really starting to grow, as you can see some of the pictures that I've shown of my ants this year. So a lot of new first-time ant keepers think, oh, I'm going to try and fool my ants, not put them into hibernation, and I'm going to see if I can get away with it. And hey-ho, all these people putting their ants into hibernation, they're going to miss out on four months, whereas I'm going to keep going and I'll be way ahead. You won't be. Don't think that skipping hibernation is going to get you any type of advantage. It's not. It's going to put you behind. It's going to stagnate your colony. It's going to cause other problems as well. Another thing to talk about here is that the ninitics, those first crop of ants that were fed exclusively on the queen regurgitating to them, they didn't get any dead insect as protein. They are a very special type of worker ant with different characteristics to normal worker ants. And one of their characteristics is that they have a lifespan of approximately three to four months. Um, but the period that they're in hibernation, when they when they slow down their metabolism, that period like doesn't count at full speed. So the four months of hibernation don't count as four months of life for them. So they might have been born, let's say, early September. We could say September and October are two months of life. And then when you bring them out of hibernation, March and April might be their their four months of life. So those nanitics are going to start dying. Mine started dying around May last year. And however many you had in this very first batch that was fed exclusively by the Queen, you will probably lose that quantity in May. So if it was 15 that came out in the first batch, you're going to have 15 deaths in May. Um, by that point, your, your colony will have doubled in size, like I said, all those new workers, and then it will have charged off. You'll have got, like I said, it will have doubled by the start of April, and then you've got all of April, so they'll have gone through a whole nother cycle by then. They'll have tons more pupa, and losing 15 workers in May to a colony that's growing like that is, is next to nothing. They just won't care. But if you don't put your ants into hibernation and they go into diapause, so they start to slow down, but they haven't lowered their metabolism because it's not cold, those nanitics are still aging and consequently their four months are now up in sort of January or February and they can start dying in the middle of winter. If, for example, like my Queen D, it's a late developed queen and you haven't got any proper workers that were fed on protein out, those nanitics can start dying. There's no eggs being laid by the queen, so there's no new workers coming along. Your colony will actually start to decline in population. An absolute worst case scenario, all of the nanitics could die and you could be left with just a queen with no workers at all anymore. And then some queens sometimes can forget how to do that growing your brood stage. They've, they've let the workers do it and they've lost the skill because it's something that seems to happen to queens. Once they've got workers, they, they don't do those things anymore and they seem to just like forget. I mean, forget's the wrong word, but the programming in their brain is, is, is removed. Um, so she might not even be able to start again in the spring and you basically might have just wiped your colony out because you didn't hibernate it. So yeah, I've, I've talked solidly now for 30 minutes. So that is a sort of an overview of what you need to do, what needs to happen, the planning you need to do and what you need to be doing for the month of October. Um, now, as I said, everybody's houses are different, everybody's flats are different, what you've got available to you in terms of cold places is different. You need now to be sort of looking around, thinking about where you live and what you can do with your ants to get them through this hibernation period. Um, thank you for listening, everybody, and um, goodbye.